On December 1st, 2000, Space Shuttle Endeavour launched STS-97 from Cape Canaveral for an 11-day mission to the International Space Station. and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour, providing power to the station as we continue to build our future in space. Well, the program. Houston now controlling the flight of Endeavour. Endeavour completing the roll, the shuttle now in a heads-down wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Twenty-five seconds into the flight, Endeavour's three liquid fuel main engines beginning to throttle back in a three-step fashion to 72% of rated performance. That will reduce the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Endeavour already one and a half miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. All systems reported to be in great shape. 52 seconds into the flight, the main engine's beginning to rev up to full throttle, 104% of rated performance. Endeavour, go at throttle up. The throttle up call from spacecraft communicator Gus Loria. On board Endeavour, Commander Brent Jett, joined on the flight deck by pilot Mike Bloomfield, flight engineer Mark Garneau of the Canadian Space Agency, and mission specialist Joe Tanner. Seated alone down on the mid-deck, mission specialist Carlos Noriega. One minute, 36 seconds into the flight. Endeavour 18 miles in altitude, 15 miles downrange, three good fuel cells, three good auxiliary power units. This view from long-range tracking cameras north of the launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation coming up in about eight seconds. Booster officer here in Mission Control reports a good solid rocket booster separation. Endeavour 32 miles in altitude, 40 miles downrange, putting on a light show for the eastern seaboard as it heads up the eastern seaboard. Guidance has converged, all three computers. And the booster officer reports the ignition of Endeavour's orbital maneuvering system engines. That will be a one minute, 42 second kick in the pants for Endeavour as the shuttle gets an additional lift to orbit to accommodate its 18-ton payload. Endeavour, two-engine tail. Copy, two-engine tail. That call indicates uh, that should one main engine fail, uh, Endeavour has enough uh, velocity at the moment to reach a transoceanic abort site in Spain. However, all three main engines continue to function as advertised. A good ride so far for the five-man crew of Endeavour. On flight day three, Commander Brent Jett flew Endeavour close to the station and docked to PMA-3. And you can see we're closing fairly slowly, only at about a tenth of a foot per second. I have to admit, I was, I was very anxious about this moment. Uh, the potential for uh, failure in the mission was uh, great if we did not dock. So we were pretty excited on the flight deck once it happened. It took a couple minutes to get the hooks uh, driven, and then after that, uh, we were all happy to have this part of the mission behind us. Well, there we are on the station. You can see it at the moment. Uh, the modules all lined up, the uh, Unity and FGB and uh, Zvezda and at the very back, uh, the uh, Soyuz vehicle. From inside Endeavour, Canadian Mission Specialist Mark Garneau used the cannon arm to remove the P-6 truss from the payload bay and maneuvering it into an overnight parking position to warm its components. Mission Specialist Joseph Tanner and Carlos Noriega 
move through Endeavor's docking tunnel and open the hatch to the ISS docking port to leave supplies and computer hardware on the doorstep of the station. The following day, Tanner and Noriega conducted the first of two planned six and a half hour spacewalks. With Tanner and Noriega assisting from the outside, Garnu used the robotic arm to attach the truss segment package, including the folded arrays and electronics atop the Z1. The two spacewalkers then tightened the attachment bolts to ensure the P6 truss was mechanically secure, and then they connected umbilicals for power and data between the new equipment and the rest of the station. They also released various restraints that were in place to protect equipment during the shuttle launch, and near the end of the spacewalk, the crew set commands to deploy the solar rays to their full, outstretched length. Unfortunately, this happened at night, so this is a view out of our uh, night uh, camera, the, the B camera. Uh, it was supposed to swing out on its own on a spring, but uh, things don't always work as expected, and I had to do a lot of pushing, as did Joe on his uh, mast when it uh, swung out. Once it was completely out, I crawled out onto the end of the mast uh, tip fitting and swung out the blanket boxes. Uh, each box weighed about 800 pounds, but it was just fingertip pressure to make it uh, go all the way out. At that point, I'm about 100 feet from the bottom of the payload bay of the orbiter. Well, with uh, Joe and Carlos complete with their task and the ground complete with its activation task, it was time to deploy the first array. Uh, we actually commanded that uh, sequence to start from on board the, the shuttle on the aft flight deck. And you can see uh, the mast come out of the canister, and it's amazing that over 100 feet of mast is uh, folded up into that canister, up into that canister, the uh, solar ray blankets. We had a great view from outside, and the still pictures that we took are absolutely fantastic. Some of the panels uh, stuck together, and they would eventually release themselves, but uh, as they did, you, you could see the dynamics in the array. They got more and more dynamic uh, to the point where, where finally the, uh, at this release here on the left uh, box in your picture, the uh, subsequent crashing down, if you will, will was enough to uh, cause uh, both tension lines on both tension reels, and here it is right there, to come off of the tension reel. You can see the resultant uh, motion in the blanket box, or the blankets. On December 8, 2000, the STS-97 crew paid the first visit to Expedition 1 crew residing in the space station. Until then, the shuttle and the station had kept one hatch closed to maintain respective atmospheric pressures, allowing the shuttle crew to conduct their spacewalks and achieve their mission goals. After a welcome ceremony and a briefing, the eight spacefarers conducted structural tests of the station and its new solar arrays transferred equipment, supplies, and trash back and forth between the spacecrafts. On December 9th, the two crews completed the final transfers of supplies to the station and other items being returned to Earth. Before we set out to work and, uh, and uh, had some Russian food as well as uh, some uh, orbiter food. All too quickly, it was uh, time, to, time for us to leave. Um, we had the hatches open uh, just a little more than 24 hours. Um, the Endeavour crew bade farewell to the Expedition 1 crew and closed the hatches between the spacecraft. After being docked together for 6 days, 23 hours, and 13 minutes, Endeavour undocked from the station and then made an hour-long circle around the ISS.
the shuttle then made a final separation burn, and after spending two more days in orbit, returned back to Earth. If you point the nose of the orbiter down, you're going to land. Um, and this is, this is the view of the, uh, through the pilot's uh, HUD, and you can see we're shooting to land just about at the start of those, those lights, the centerline lights of the runway. That's uh, pretty amazing. You uh, start this process over Australia, and you're able to touch down within 100 feet or so of your desired point. Uh, so that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. It's uh, a great testament to the technology of the shuttle. After we were on the ground, Mike deployed the drag chute to help slow us down. Uh, we derotated to get the nose on the ground, and uh, the next big task for me was to stop with the nose tire directly on the centerline lights. Following its undocking on December 1st, 2000, the same day that the Endeavour launched, Progress M14 spent 25 days in free flight. It then came back and docked with the Nadir port on Zarya on December 26th. Like the original docking, the TORU system had to be used. Though the fault with the KERS system had been resolved, the procedure used to abort the original KERS docking attempt, which involved a retraction of an antenna that could not be redeployed, was irreversible. Progress M14 remained docked for six weeks before undocking again on February 8, 2001. Now supplied with power from the P6 Trust, the next module, Destiny, would be added on the next shuttle mission, STS-98.